Welcome to Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews, the only show that's going to teach you how to be somebody. Where in your life did you learn that you're not good at Take what you're most passionate about and what you're most fearful of. And what is the plan to overcome that fear? And what is the plan to enact that passion? Welcome to Winners Wallets and Worldviews. I am your host, AJ Armstrong. You can follow me on Instagram at Aaron Armstrong33, or you can go to my website, AaronJArmstrong.com. Joining me today, we have a phenomenal guest, a wonderful entrepreneur, thought leader, and innovator in the world of social media. We have Ali Shaw on the other end. Ali, how are you doing, brother? Very good. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about, it, it looks like tape reels is the solution that you have. Um, that's, is that how it's pronounced and, and everything with the business, right? Tape reels? Yeah, tapereel.com. Tapereel.com, a like social to, media platform. I, yeah, I like to throw in the .com in there because it's, it's so hard to find a good .com domain <laughs> name nowadays. <laughs> yeah, especially for like a startup and, you know, you get like just the two word you know, like a tape reel. I mean, it, that would be like so expensive to get a good domain name without like a .co or a .io or something, but you got the .com, man. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you know, it was really difficult because before this, uh, when I initially launched my company, it was called Tape Book and the .com wasn't available. So I had to settle for a .app. And I just, Ooh. every time I, I just hated that domain so much. But I got really lucky with this domain. Like usually like a two syllable, two word domain, you have, you're guaranteed to find like somebody squatting on it, selling it for thousands of dollars. But I actually got mine for $2.99. So. Dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's some freaking digital real estate right there. That's the game. <laughs> I know. Eh? It was just the luck of the draw, I guess. <laughs> Oh, well, awesome. Well, well, Ali, let's talk a little bit about um, your story and kind of where you came from and how you you got into the entrepreneur space. And what I really want to take the listeners through today is this, the world of social media today and, you know, some of the downsides of it, but preserving the goodness of it, you know, and we'll talk a lot about that later. But first, I'd like to hear just your story. How'd you get into this? Sure. I've uh, I've always had the sort of entrepreneurial itch growing up. Uh, I mean, my first sort of startup was like when I was 10 years old, I used to collect uh, hockey cards for NHL players. And my neighbor and I decided, well, you know, we've got a collection of cards, different sets from like Upper Deck and Pro Set. Um, these are the companies that make these uh, collectible cards. I'm learning and, uh, more and more about this because all my buddies are, are flipping cards and stuff on Facebook. We were just talking about this the other day. So it's funny you bring this up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is uh, before Pokemon got popular. <laughs> <laughs> and then kids changed, you know what I mean? <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, we used to collect cards and we had like a whole bunch of extras. And so him and I were like, okay, why don't we, you know, uh, make our own little card sets and sell them to other kids on the street in the neighborhood and uh i remember we like put together a variety of cards we had to pick and choose we're like okay well let's make a you know a set with a uh, with a number of cards that are really good that people would want and then maybe sure. some that don't have too many so that they keep them coming back to buy some more so we had all this plaid and everything and we even like glue glued all the sets together uh around paper and drew like a little logo on it uh and we sat outside with our little table for pretty much the whole day and 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 got zero customers <laughs> but then towards the end of the day this one kid was coming back from vacation from the u.s and i think he had a few u.s dollars on him and he's like he was a like a hockey player too like he played uh midget hockey and uh he comes up to us and he's like oh what are you guys selling and he was really interested and then he bought a a packet of cards and basically paid me uh, seven us dollars and me and my friend split it that was the first sort of experience i had with like 
by or creating a product, buying it, and trying to find a customer for it and actually selling it. Born, so, born into entrepreneurship early, getting the, I know, the customers right? off. The, well, you said you came from, from the U.S. with U.S. dollars. So where are you at during this time? So I, I was in uh, Alberta, which is a province in Canada. Yep. So I, I live in Canada. And uh, now I'm on the east coast of Canada uh, near Toronto. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, since then, like, I've always tried to come up with ideas or solutions and been really uh, interested in, in, like, running my own business. And I think the motivation for it is, one, just having some autonomy um, in, in the work that you do, and two, trying to make a difference in, in the world, I mean, you know, bringing delight and um, something new to uh, existence that you know never existed before uh, i think there's like a lot of satisfaction that comes from that creative process so that's essentially what has been driv driving me over the last couple of decades uh through the journey that i've been through in entrepreneurship uh, i used to own a, a franchise restaurant for three years owned and operated it sold it and then uh, I had a mobile app startup uh, called Bubble Finder, where you could like browse location-based uh, restaurant promotions or retail promotions that were happening around you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, this was before Uber was super popular. But one of the one of the feedback that I got from customers back then was that you know, oh, this is such a great app. You know, I, I wish you could deliver like if i wish i could just order from the app and they, and they could deliver to me and you know back then like it just didn't click that you could have this sort of uber infrastructure where you could get drivers and, sure, sure. and people to you know uh deliver for you and and so uh that economy just didn't exist that gig economy and uh and that's one thing I've learned over the years is like market timing. Like you can have great ideas, but if you, if the, if the market is just not um, ready for it, uh, you know, it's really difficult to find success. Yeah. And, uh, and then from there, like I, I uh, had another sort of startup idea called AdFits, which was like a reward rewards based uh, advertising platform. The way I like to describe it is like a, uh, uh, well, in Canada, we have this thing called Air Miles. Uh, it's like a rewards uh, program where you can collect miles and then redeem them for like traveling or, or yep. other items. Just any kind of travel reward thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And so the idea was that maybe you know we could you could have like a um, a sort of a membership program for websites that you visit where you can collect miles depending on how often you visit certain websites. Uh, it was like a loyalty based program that way. Um, but you know, that, it, I mean, the advertising industry is, it's uh, very set in its ways, especially the current infrastructure. There's so many layers, so many players that are involved that it's really difficult to break in. And, and one thing that I learned from that experience as well was that, um, it's important to have a team and I didn't really have a team. I had just outsourced it to one person who was just helping me out. But, uh, I think in order to, to be successful in entrepreneurship, uh, you, you have to find the right people and, and create that initial team that's going to help you really move your, uh, startup forward. Let's talk a little bit about that for a second, if we can, uh, just sure. about who's, Who's on your team? Who are some of these people uh, that you're calling up? What skill sets are you looking for? Is it unique depending on what you're going for? Or do you have a designated go-to guy for a certain thing? Well, obviously, uh, you know, I'm the only founder uh, currently at tapereal.com, but, um, you know, I'm looking for a co-founder to join. Um, right now, I mean, I've got uh, specific skill sets that um, I'm working with. Uh, in, in terms of like people having that skill set in development, whether it's front end or back end, and then a, a UI UX designer. Um, and then if there's like uh, project based work, that kind of stuff I might outsource just to get different perspectives. Uh, but in, you know, uh, I, I'm looking for somebody who is thinking long term. And I think that's really important. I feel like we live in a day in an age where um, people are are almost rewiring themselves for short term thinking. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Oh it's yeah. That it's that 
post on on social media that's going to go viral or it's like you know uh, oh i just want to like it we live in the age of instant and we've bas we're basically programming ourselves to uh only expect you know short-term results that dopamine rush um, and it's it's hard to find people that you know want to think long long term right and and they're willing to make those short-term sacrifices for the long-term gain you're really hitting on something i, th I think is totally true uh, if you observe almost the and we'll talk about this in a second but if you observe the trends like on social media i mean i'm i'm old now you know the big two eight i so i was late to the TikTok game right so like right. I just started getting into TikTok and looking at everything and I, I was showing my wife, you know, like, hey, this is kind of what it is. And it was almost like mind rotting TikTok, yeah. you know, because <laughs> it's just one after another, after another 15 second clip, 15 second clip. And it was just like, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and then you look at the clock and all of a sudden time goes by and it was just, it's so just dopamine infested, just gratification as quickly as possible. And it was just, mind rotting is what it felt like to be honest and it, it's i feel like we've seen that kind of evolve with some of the big platforms you know it's gone from more uh comprehensive networks like you know like facebook or something that now only old people use and then we have instagram which was kind of that my generation you know that got kind of fun with it and then now it's you got the tiktoks and some of these other emerging platforms and it's interesting because how do you how do you like what do you think about the way social media is going you mentioned as we were talking about this like just short term gratification everything's got to be so quick attention grabbing and it's making us marketers and advertisers scrambling out every minute to try to figure out how do we compete in this world of just noise is what it's becoming it's a lot of noise man and uh it's really difficult to stand out um nowadays um and you know it kind of brings to light, like, uh, was it Andy Warhol who said that in the future, everyone will have 15 minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it kind of feels like that, right? You're just gonna, like, you're only as good as your last tweet or your last TikTok video mm -hmm. and whatnot. And these social platforms, the, the, the architecture, the foundation that they're built upon is an ad-based revenue model. And that is fundamentally the problem because they will design everything around keeping you on their platform longer, keeping you engaged, getting you addicted, you know, getting you hooked. And when, when that motive is there, it's there because they want to be able to serve you more ads and attract more and then generate more revenue on that end. And so you end up becoming the product. In your, in your opinion, what do you think one of the, the platforms that are out there is the most addictive or destructive or are they all bad, equally as bad? <laughs> well, you know, they, they all have their sort of uh, nuances. Like Twitter, I feel like, is just a lot of anger and um, mm. meanness. Like, you, you know, people will just, just like, trolls, say some, you know? yeah, there's a lot of trolls and, and stuff like that. And then when you go to like Facebook, it's, I feel like it's a very polarizing environment. You know, yes. you, you have an opinion and somebody just has that counter opinion and you get into yes. like this endless thread of like arguing. So it feels like a very argumentative platform. And then Instagram feels very fake. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like a lot yeah. of influencers or people showing, trying to show off, I guess. One up or, each other. And... Yeah, it's a, it's a different kind of uh, vibe. And then you have TikTok, which is more about the virality, trying to make funny short videos but there's not really anything social about it you know what i mean like it feels more like an entertainment network and in general i feel like that about most of the platforms unless you have complete you know complete control over your private settings and and who you're connected to uh, most of these platforms are not true social uh, ecosystems there they are forms of media they're forms of entertainment and again, it comes back to their business model. So the longer they can keep you entertained and engaged, the more ads they can serve you and the more uh, money goes into their pockets. So TikTok is one of those ones that when I started using it, I just immediately felt really bad for the younger generation out there because 
mm. this was like I, I immediately like I just I have the self awareness to know that this is super addictive. You know what I mean? But right. younger people oh, yeah. don't have that self awareness, and they, and they're gonna get you know pulled into this, and they'll just start swiping and swiping and swiping, and they could spend hours on it. And I'm sure there are many adults who do that too, mature people who can just waste a lot of time on TikTok. The analogy I like to draw is that it's like being in a casino in front of a slot machine and you see a gambling addict just keep pressing that button and seeing everything spin. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's a good analogy. It, it's interesting if you, if you look at how entertainment's evolved, you know, over the last 100 years even, it, it's, or even the last 150 years where it kind of started off with like reading and literature required a, a really intense amount of focus to really learn the story and be entertained and have the satisfaction in the, you know, the result and the conclusion of those stories. And then we got the motion picture industry that emerged in the early 1900s. And it was like the first time that that was like mind rotting, you know, it became went from stories that were written now to visual stories. And then if you watch how the movie industry evolved over the, the decades, the shots are becoming more quickly cut. Uh, you know, it, it goes. It went from having very long still shots, but then people mm -hmm. started getting bored, and then they started cutting them up quicker. And now, if you watch a movie, there's just dozens of camera angles, very rapidly rotating and adjusting. And then we get, you know, the emerging in the mid two thousands of social of social media, and that's where they've almost perfected this attention engineering game, to where it's just this addiction that you can't help and. I'm wondering if it is this just a a part of of how entertainment's going to continue to evolve, or is this just destructive? Is this going to ruin, you know, our ability to think and our ability to have long attention spans and our ability to focus on things and memorize things? What do you think? I I I think you're absolutely right, and you and you've hit the nail right on the head. Like it's uh, it's concerning because uh, you know just the way you described it especially in movies i've seen it i've seen that happen in movies as well where before it was you know you have like well thought out stories and the cinematography was beautiful but now it's just it's become so choppy the editing mm -hmm. and fast even in even in like uh sitcoms like for example brooklyn 99 Sometimes I can't even keep up with with you know the conversations and 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 the quick back and forth that they that they have, but it it's I don't I don't I don't want to say that's the society we're living in, but I feel like we're creating that society. We're playing a part in it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's, it, 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 they figured a way to engineer these dopamine receptors to just keep us just hyper engaged. There was a show I was watching on Netflix. It, it was called uh, Money Heist. I don't know if you had a chance to see it. It's, oh, I uh, love that show. Yeah, it's like a, <laughs> it's a Spanish film. For those of you that haven't watched it, it's like a Spanish film about these this heist that goes on at the Spanish Mint um, where they print money and they're going to start printing money and they do this hold up with hostages. And it's, it's an interesting show. And I was watching, th I just binge watched it, right? I watched it the first season. Then I watched the second season and I'm like halfway into the second season. And I'm just like, this show isn't really like that good. It's just perfectly attention engineered because mm -hmm. what they would just do is they would, they'd get the, the one, one character storyline to a certain point and then they cut it off and they jump and then you'd start over at a new character storyline and they get it to a certain point and they just had this systematic rotation of attention. And it, you know, it's just another example of how things are, are less about the art and it's more about the engineering of our attention span. And I think it, it illustrates your point. Is this where just society is going to go or is there something, you know, we can do about it to save our, like, is there going to be psychological, you know, um, issues that arise from this? I don't know. Well, I mean, just look at uh, the mental health uh, sort of, space and how it's grown over the years and become more and more prominent and part of the reason i think i mean i i, I don't obviously have any research to back it up but i know there are lots of research studies that have been done uh, about uh, the effects of social media and how it can lead to narcissistic behavior 
and uh, you know um, it can play on our psychological um, oh, yeah. senses, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I worry because I've I've got children, and um, I, you know I think about the world that they'll be sort of living in, and uh, as a parent, like. Do I want my children on TikTok creating videos, trying to go viral? Like, I don't know. I mean, there are parents out there that are actively involved in their children's TikTok videos too. You know what I mean? Like, uh, that you'll see kids saying that, you know, my dad will buy me a car if I get a million likes on this video. <laughs> you know, so it's like, yeah, and I, I I've noticed that on TikTok that like a lot of times parents are filming some of these things and. It's, and you know, is it? It seems like every generation goes through that thing where television was going to start rotting people's minds and and all this and that. And I don't know. I mean, is it just going to be a way we evolve and we just learn to deal with things? But I, I think it's getting to a point where you're right. There's like this level of narcissism that comes into it. I've been guilty of it on on my social media posts and trying to build mm-hmm. a platform. And I've found myself as trying to market things on social media, becoming a consumer of the content way more than I originally tried to use the program for, which was just to, you know, personal brand and and continue to build this podcast and gain reach and discovery. And here I am an addict of the system. It's just the Scarface rule. It's like, you don't snort your own stash, right? <laughs> and it's like, that's what we end up doing. <laughs> yeah. It's challenging because uh, like, where else are you going to go to get that kind of reach right or or ability to target especially like facebook and instagram with with their uh network it's you're just able to reach so many people but at the same time i think with all these social platforms that are out there practicing these traditional models i i feel like there is an opportunity for um you know uh incumbents to to, to sprout up and say, hey, we're going to do something differently here. And I think there is a market of people that are tired of traditional social media and, and that whole game that, you know, they may be open to new ways of connecting and, and interacting and people coming together. What are some of those um, opportunities that you see? What do you, what do you think? Where do you think this, could, this problem could be solved? Uh, I think uh, the business model obviously has to be a little bit different. Um, there has to, uh, instead of being ad based, where you, you know you're focused on uh, metrics like engagement, KPIs, uh, engagement driven KPIs, uh, you need a, a different business model. Either, I mean, on on my app, that's part of the reason why you know, I decided from, from the get-go that we're going to preserve people's privacy. We're not going to target you. We're not, you know, I have to really get this idea out there in, in the form of blog posts as well to say, look, we're not going to be like the traditional social media guys. We're going to be a little bit different. We're going to try and build uh, a, a social platform where people come first, not, you know, um, not ads or, or other, uh, um, you know, in engagement driven metrics. So, I mean, well, that, that's interesting. The engagement driven metrics side of it. So it seems like the, the dopamine rush for me as a consumer, as an addict comes from the feedback you get from your platform. You know, it's the the amount of likes you get or the amount of comments or the, the, the people you have directly engaging with you. And I think that's probably why the social programs all gravitated towards that as their primary driver KPI is the amount of engagement because we, I know as a consumer, you know, I put, put a post out there, I get all the little hearts and they're colored red because they engineered the color red is perfectly to make me feel a little burst of dopamine every time I get a like or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm interested just to hear how you think we can get away from that because that's the, that's the addiction really is seeing that feedback come back in and, and getting gratified through that. And if there's a way you can get gratified through a more authentic measure, for lack of a better word, 
that would seem to be much more uh, healthy. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, look at the, I mean, other than engagement metrics, look at the way or the, the cognitive load involved in posting content across any of these platforms, like updating your status on Facebook is easy, or you can share a link it's, it's, uh, or a meme, you know, same thing with Instagram, uh, on TikTok, you know, you can make a quick viral video very quickly. Um, and so they have made it very easy to post whatever you want, whenever you want, even on Twitter. Um, and I think that is part of the problem as well, because uh, people are not putting thought into what they're uh, expressing on these platforms. I you agree. Know, they're just basically spewing content for the sake of spewing content and generating and being, you know, sort of visible. And when you, when you have that, I mean, it's it, the quality of the content. I mean, obviously there is good quality content. I don't want to, you know, take that away from anybody who's producing great content out there, but it also leads to people creating bad content. Um, and uh, it removes uh, also a sense of accountability. So for example, it's easy to be behind a keyboard and say whatever you want under an avatar. Right. True. Uh, but you probably wouldn't say that to that person if you were face to face having a meaningful conversation or an authentic, you know, being your authentic self. Right. You know, um, it's kind of a, an interesting thought about you look at these gurus, uh, these, these marketing gurus and these social media people and the, the cookie cutter advice you kind of get from them is put out good content. And that's, you know, it sounds like good advice. And, but I would argue that it's more about attention engineered content than it is about good content. And I can give you a very simple example. You could go get a professionally produced video done by uh, some kind of production company or videographer in your area and you could put that out on social media and it's very unlikely that that does significantly better than if you could figure out a way that had a catchy headline a bunch of colors uh, a bunch of big bolded words things like that that was much lower produced and a much lower quality piece of content so i think that's the that's the argument i would put out there is that I feel like it's it's more about attention engineering than it is about the quality of content, which gets at the problem, is what you're saying. It's like you can you can put trolls out there, you can put people that are uh, posers or whatever you want to call them, you know, just but but low quality ideas and thoughts are being circulated and becoming very popular and influential because of that, just that, you know, they they've mastered a way of engineering attention, but their ideas and the aren't necessarily better than anybody else. What do you think? Absolutely, and, and uh, you, I think not having that accountability uh, for, for that content, for what you're putting out there, or that realization that how it may be impacting others um, in society is part of the reason why maybe we have a lot of problems, you know, a lot of uh, uh, people you know, being very opinionated about their beliefs and then uh, other people as well. And, and then those online fights that happen as a result of it. Uh, you know, on when I was thinking about the uh, business model for Tapril, you know, I, I was thinking, I'm like, okay, how can, how can we bring back accountability into people's lives in terms of like what they're saying and what they're putting out into the world? And that's part of the reason why we have like different membership plans where uh, you, if you want to record more content, you uh, sign up for a premium membership plan and you're given a certain number of minutes per month that you can use on Tapriel. And the, the logic or the reasoning behind that is that if you know that you only have a certain number of minutes, um, you'll be a little bit more thoughtful. You'll make them count. Yeah, you'll make it count. You don't want to waste them. You want to put something out there that's going to be of value. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, we've got a free plan and people on the free plan will post just random stuff. But then to get the good quality stuff, I mean, uh, when, you, when you automatically sign up for that premium membership, you're adding that sense of accountability into your life and you're saying, okay, 
if I'm going to post something, it's going to be meaningful. It's going to be, I'm going to express something that is authentic. It, uh, you know, it's true to who I am and hopefully it makes a difference in the world. Um, There's a, another platform before I, if this thought loses my mind. Um, it, it, do you listen to anything being from Alberta? You, do you, you've heard of Jordan Peterson? Absolutely. Is, I, I know he was interested in starting a platform where it was a similar concept to what you're saying, where you could get more educational and academic discussions. And one of his ideas was you would have, if you wanted to comment on a video, let's say a, a 45 minute video, you would have to put your comment at a certain position in the, at a timestamp in the video. And then you would have to comment at least like 250 words. There was a minimum of the comment because mm -hmm. for a comment, then you couldn't just troll. You'd have, if you did want to troll, you'd have to have a very long, compelling statement to troll. And the idea was to kind of allow people to disagree on specific things instead of holistically bucketing the video as something that's garbage. They would have to pinpoint a certain topic that they thought was right or wrong or something like that. Um, have you looked into that or like, what are your thoughts on what he's been trying to do and, and what you're doing? That's actually very interesting. Um, I didn't think about it in terms of putting a limit in, uh, in the comments, but on Taprio, what we have are audio comments. So instead of leaving a text-based comment, you can actually reply to the person with your voice and say, Hey, you know what? I really liked what you said there. This is my experience. And you can sort of continue like a, a conversation with the person uh, through audio uh, going back and forth, time shifted mm. conversations. So that we, we added that because we wanted to keep the platform as human as possible. You know what I mean? We don't want uh, algorithms or bots and, uh, you know, just pictures, memes, links and stuff like that. We want to put, people first and i think that is the holy grail of uh you know a true social network where people can show up as they are connect have real social interactions back and forth dialogue um and and in the process you're creating these social memories is what i like to call them because we have like obviously you know if Traditionally, we had photo albums for our pictures. We have Instagram now that holds a lot of our pictures or, or even our phone, but we don't really have a photo album for memorable conversations, you know, or thoughts that, that we've had in our minds and we want to sort of uh, express them in a meaningful way. And, and that has been sort of the foundation upon which I'm trying to build this platform because I want to do it a little bit differently. And, I don't know if there's a big enough market for it or not, but I think there are people out there who think along these lines and are maybe tired of the status quo. And, and, and especially after going through this pandemic and, you know, the shift that we're experiencing in life and the way we connect with each other, the social distancing and whatnot. Um, you know, I just, I feel like there are people out there that are hungry for this, but there is no platform doing it um, in an authentic way. I, I think what you're doing has wonderful intentions and it's certainly ambitious, but it's an awesome, it's rooted in, I think, something that's very virtuous and very necessary because I, I just know, especially after all this COVID stuff hit, the amount of addiction I grew to these different social platforms is just like you're saying, I'm self-aware enough to know how bad it's gotten. I have the little alerts on my phone to show me how long I've been sitting there on my phone. Uh, I have the, the notes on my Instagram to see how long I've been sitting on Instagram. And it's become so toxic. And I think that it would, it would be wonderful if, when people like you can come along with solutions to this thing that we do crave social interaction. We do crave or crave connection with other people and, uh, and reach and discovery and all those things that are great about social media, the, the cost effectiveness of being able to broadcast a, a podcast like this or, or other things is really wonderful, but it comes at such a catastrophic price. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have cyber bullying, you have um, people that 
get so addicted to the likes and the notifications that it, it changes what they decide they want to post. It changes what they believe. It changes their, their, you know, their own belief system and their ideas. I mean, you know, it's, it's unreal that what this inf the influence and the, the engineering behind this attention has done. And I applaud you. I really think this is an awesome concept you're moving with. And I, I just hope you get some freaking traction with it, man, because <laughs> that would be really cool if we could get this thing out into the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not easy. I mean, even I've been pitching investors and a lot of folks think social is just done. You know what I mean? They're like, there's no really? way you can, yeah, it's, unless you have a super killer uh, customer acquisition model or uh, something super viral like TikTok, you know what I mean? It's it's hard to break into this space with something new, but uh, you know I think it's important. I think you know uh, there are people out there that uh, you know are tired of the status quo and want something uh, authentic and meaningful. So um, I mean, I, I sometimes get the itch to make changes on my net on 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 tape reel that you know because people are saying well tiktok does this or other platforms do this so why don't you try it too and it's like oh but i don't want to become the same thing you know what i mean we're trying to do trap yeah i mean this is just a trap that we're gonna go down like uh, you know we have to think a little bit outside of the box but um yeah, the uh, cell phone addiction and the time spent, like I've noticed my time spent go, going up as well. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to break free from it. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, we, we live in a, a very unique time. And I think to undo the conditioning uh, of the past two decades will take some time. It, I mean, if that's going to be our cause, then we're in it for the long term. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you've done a couple startups. You're, you know a lot about social media and the practices. I mean, what, what advice would you give to some other entrepreneurs or maybe aspiring business leaders, you know, just from the things you've learned and the things you've messed up what what's some uh, some thoughts or ideas you would give them, and then I'd ask you a follow up question about what would what advice would you give them in the world of managing themselves in this social media landscape, if you will. Yeah, and one thing about the social landscape I feel is there's a lot of uh, status signaling, um, and you kind of have. You, you you get pulled into this vortex of um, showing some kind of status, whether you're doing something cool or reading something, you know, that's more insight, that's very insightful, or, you know, you're, you're showing, uh, you're, you're putting out these status signals. And um, the, the other thing, the trap that you want to avoid, I guess, is, creating a persona of yourself that is not real or authentic um, because I think the long term the effects are not positive like you you now have this version of yourself that's online and then you have this version of yourself that you know only you your family and your close friends know and well, then, if I could ask you a follow-up on that really quickly sure um, you know as far as being your authentic self on online and offline what would you say to, you know, there's certain things when you, you get up on stage, you'll say something, right? And then you get with your friends, you say another thing, and then you're with grandma, you talk to another thing. Mm -hmm. Which version of your authentic self do you think is appropriate to be on social media? Because, you know, you have conversations with your friends, or your buddies that are certainly much different than something you might want to broadcast out to the world. So I guess what, what level of censorship would you put on that? <clears throat> Well, I, th I think context is important. And, uh, you know, uh, the, part of our long-term vision is to have the ability to um, create public and private uh, spaces 
for you to express yourself. So if you're in a public space and your audience is work related, then obviously you put on your work persona. Um, and then if you're uh, amongst friends, you've got a private group and you can just be yourself in that private group. Um, but uh, on, on traditional social media, it's, it's interesting because uh, most of these platforms and in general, I think in social media, uh, you know, 80% of the content is created by 10 to 20% of the users. The rest are just watching um, or posting irregularly or not super active. Um, and so, uh, you know, if it almost feels like you have to play a certain game uh, and have the social rules for that game uh, in a particular platform. So on Instagram, it might just be your filters, what you're using your filters or how you're expressing yourself there. Um, Facebook, you know, it might be a different angle depending on which groups you're in or, or how you're uh, projecting out some signals to your friends um, on that platform. Um, so, <clears throat> I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. It's just, you know, as especially like during, during these times, like I really try to avoid talking about politics as much as possible on this podcast and on all my social media, because mm -hmm. it's so polarizing, especially today. It's just, everyone's got an opinion and, you know, it's now becoming an issue if you don't have an opinion. But, yeah. you know, in, in my friend groups and my friend circles, <laughs> it, we, we debate and have a great time with it. And then at the end of the day, we shake hands, we're friends, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. And right. it, it's, it's a pretty large part of my discussions with my friends and family. But then on social media, I, I absolutely restrict it because people just can't handle it because it's just all of a sudden I make a statement and then, you know, the whole world's trying to dig up every piece of garbage that ever happened in my life. Every dirty skeleton gets on and I, I got a hit piece written on me or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it just seems like there's some level of censorship that you want to put on without limiting, you know, who you are and what you authentically believe and things like that. P part of the reason is also because you're using the medium of, let's say, text. Uh, and and when when you type something um, unless you are absolutely perfect in the way you know you structure your sentences and, unless it's and, an essay right <laughs> yeah you know what I mean like you're very uh, academic about it the way people interpret it is going to vary across a wide spectrum somebody might uh, take what you're saying and completely understand it and, and understand it completely differently and uh, you know, uh, construe a completely different meaning uh, from what you what your intentions were, and it's because we it, it happens even when I'm communicating with my wife. Like I'll text something, or she'll text something, and one of us will interpret it the wrong way and say, "Well, why did you say it like this?" Like I could sense your tone in the text. Like you know. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, it's like, well, actually, I was just driving, and I you know I was at a red light, and I didn't have time to to you know thoughtfully say what i wanted to say so i just quickly said that uh, so that medium i think is part of the process part of the tension that gets created or the polarization that gets created in social platforms but when you have your voice or you show up with video uh kind of like what we we're trying to push on tape reel is come as you are mm. you know the the interaction is a little bit more civil um, you know, people will listen to you. And because you're having time shifted conversations, if you get a reply, you have to sit there and listen to the reply before you can chime in, right? It's not right. like a live conversation where sometimes people can just interrupt each other or get distracted. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly, a, certainly an interesting time. And, you know, maybe that's full circle back to one of the, the big problems. And I hope maybe you can solve it someday is, is having the attention span to be able to read someone's comprehensive thoughts on a certain political topic and you know evaluate it all but when you have tiktoks that are 15 seconds going through and and tweets that are 250 characters or less that seem to be driving a majority of people's opinions 
the clever people are much more rewarded than the um, intellectually consistent people. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it, it will be nice someday. And I think what your platform seems to be doing is, is, is getting started in that space and really making an attempt to, to make things real, to allow people's authentic thoughts come out and uh, make it more personal and, and kind of demystify these anonymous troll counts that just decide they want to bully people and, and do all these things that are nasty over social media. Mm-hmm. So what you're working on is really awesome, man. And um, I, w- I just want to ask you, you know, any last questions is just where can people, you know, connect with you or be a part of your, your program, um, be a part of your network, help you, you're looking for partners and investors you mentioned early on, you know, like how do people get a hold of you follow along on your journey? Well, uh... I'm on all these social media platforms, but I, I don't like to promote them. So I'll just say, if you want to connect with me one-to-one, download Tape Reel uh, from the App Store. It's only on iOS for now, but we'll be working on an Android version. And follow me on that platform. And if you want to even have a conversation, we could record a tape together. Um, and... Um, and uh, and connect that way. Uh, the other platform I like to be active on is LinkedIn um, for professional networking. Yep. So if uh, if you're on LinkedIn, feel free to send out an invite um, and and connect there. Awesome. Well, Ali, brother, thank you so much for uh, for giving us some really interesting things to consider for bringing us some really cool solutions that you have to this this crazy world of attention engineering and social media and TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be a, a voice of reason in the space and someone that, that genuinely wants to contribute to a solution instead of feeding the problem with more more attention engineering tricks and hacks to, to sell to advertisers and marketers, which I'm going to have on my next show, by the way, oh. <laughs> Facebook ad expert. But, uh, oh, nice. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if we can, if we can get your movement going, man, and, and if this podcast can help people start to consider and think differently about their use and addiction to social media, and if they still want that social interaction, Go check it out, tapereel.com. It's R-E-A-L, I believe, right? Tapereel.com. That's right. And you guys can set up an account. You can work with uh, Brother Ali over here, and um, it'll be a great time. And I think it's a really cool movement we can start to initiate. So Ali, I'll leave you with the last word, man. Any lasting thoughts or advice to our listeners? Well, if you're in the entrepreneurial space, uh, you know, there's there's sort of, two roads that you can potentially take. One road is you follow the traditional route of creating that super sticky stellar platform or place, uh, which is driven by money, profit, and uh, venture capitalists. Or you can think about, uh, you know, maybe the road less traveled (laughs) um, and try and align yourself to some kind of purpose. Uh, and a purpose that, you know, takes into account humanity, uh, future generations, and the world that, you know, you want to live in or you want to create for, for yourself and future generations. I think it, when you align yourself uh, with that, you're, you'll uh, find it more fulfilling uh, and meaningful on this journey. And you'll learn a lot about not only yourself, but... Uh, the world around you in the process. Um, So don't get into entrepreneurship just because you read a TechCrunch article, somebody raised a few millions of dollars and now is living on a yacht or something like that. (laughs) I mean, that's that's a wonderful journey, but it really doesn't happen uh, to everyone in reality. So um, those are just some parting words for people in the entrepreneurship space who, um, you know, are thinking of starting up their own business. Well, think well about said. your purpose. Yeah, well, well said. And you're absolutely right. So folks, once again, that was uh, Ali Shah here. 
If you guys want to listen to this podcast, share it, comment, like on whatever platform you're listening on. It really helps us and it'll help Ali also get this movement going and, and get his platform established as well. You can listen to this podcast at aaronjarmstrong.com slash podcasts, or you guys can always follow and connect with me at aaronjarmstrong.com or my Instagram, aaronarmstrong33. Once again, folks, this is Winner's Wallets and Worldviews. Be somebody.